Philippe, let me ask you uh, on your sustainability agenda, for instance. You know, there's a lot of talk about how the new bottom line is uh, people, planet, profits. Um, uh, do you subscribe to that, number one? And when it comes to uh, a company, a corporate, uh, corporate entity having a purpose, how do you then, you know, join the dots between purpose and profits so everyone's happy? So let me start with an example of what we concretely did do. We have this winery uh, uh, of Chandon, uh, not very far from here in the north of, uh, of, the, of the city. Uh, that winery has in recent years uh, completely exited uh, herbicides. We are now deriving 60% of our electricity through solar power. We have just built a new facility to clean our water so that it can be reutilized. So we have really massively invested in sustainability. And that's true around the world. We have a program, a worldwide program called Living Together, Living Soils, Living Together. So we have decided to focus on soils. Mm -hmm. Because soils is what we inherited from previous generations. Mm -hmm. Soils is what we will transmit to future generations. And soils is something which is poorly understood today. And you know, in one spoon of mm -hmm. soil, of a healthy soil, there, is as, there are as many microorganisms than the entire population of the planet. So it's very, very rich. And so we are working on that and we have programs. We have, for instance, we have launched a conference which took place the first time uh, uh, two years ago uh, called the Living Soils Global Conference. Mm -hmm. We are going to redo it this year where we bring experts from all over the planet together. We act as a catalyst to bring them together in different topics and help science progress on this very, very critical topic of soils. Now, besides that, of course, we do what I just described. We do work on biodiversity. We are, for instance, Champagne region, which is today is more or less a monoculture region. Mm -hmm. We are right now planting hedges again, planting trees, so we get more biodiversity, that we get more carbon uh, capture uh, in the vineyards. So all of that is happening. And all of that costs money, of course, coming to the profit question. But I think, and you said, you talk about profit and people. First of all, people. Why do we do this? We do it because we think it's the right thing to do. And we do it because our people request it. Our teams want that. You do not hire a young graduate anymore who doesn't ask you what you are doing on the sustainability side. And the fact that you have a credible program, that you do things which are, have a certain importance, makes you an attractive employer to them. Mm -hmm. Because they don't want to work for someone or for a company which doesn't live to its social responsibilities. So people is so it's completely consistent with the people agenda. I would even say it's the biggest supporter today of our people agenda. Mm -hmm. And then profit. Yes, it is expensive. I mean, we 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 invest up to upwards to 100 million euros per year in sustainability measures. Mm -hmm. Now, we have to we have to earn that money. We have to generate that income and still deliver the right profit to our shareholders. So it means we have to manage our companies in a way which makes that possible. But again, we don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. This is absolutely necessary. It's our responsibility. It's important for our people. It's also increasingly important for our shareholders who are asking us to progress on these topics. So it is just a new parameter of the way of doing business today. And I would say, in a way, it's in continuity to what our ancestors did who created these maisons 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and who did transmit them from generation to generation. Well, if you want to transmit something, the first thing you have to make sure is that it's sustainable. Otherwise, you are going to transmit something which will not work anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, what I'm doing today with my teams is in perfect continuity to what we have learned from our forefathers and what we want to transmit to the next generations of employees, leaders, shareholders of Muay Tennessee and of LVMH uh, at large. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have to give them a legacy worth keeping and fostering. Absolutely. Okay, let me just zoom out, Philippe, now and ask you, of course, you know, we've, we've heard all the conversations that happened, for instance, at Davos recently, um, you know, when it's so what is your outlook? What's your business outlook going into now? We're already in 2024, but what is your outlook? Uh, despite the economic challenges and headwinds, how are you seeing everything work out? Well, I have to look at it from the internal side and then, of course, from the external side. If I look at it from the internal side, our brands are healthier than ever. 
uh, our liquids are, we believe, the best in the market, or at least among the best in the market. We also have some competitors who do a pretty good job there. So we have a wonderful product base, a wonderful brand base. We have been very innovative the last years. So on that side, we believe we have a very healthy uh, starting point. Then, of course, we are living in a world which is, of course, going through phases of inflation, higher interest rates, geopolitical uh, uh, problems in some parts of the world, um, and for which we have no way to predict in which direction they will go. And so, to me, the question is not about um, predicting or having a crystal ball. The question is how do you build an organization which has the agility to adapt fast to changing a changing environment. So it's about being agile, it's about being able to accelerate where you can accelerate, to slow down where you need to slow down, and do that relatively fast, mm -hmm. because we cannot predict what the world will be in six months from now, but we can construct organizations which will adapt relatively fast to whatever happens in their environment. Mm -hmm. The world could look very different in six months from now, given elections in, you know, key countries, global economies. Almost half like of India the population in the world will have elections, mm -hmm. some of which are very, very predictable, mm -hmm. and some of which are not so predictable. May I ask you which ones, according to you, are predictable? Well, I get some, in some countries, um, elections uh, tend to uh, uh, confirm the uh, current uh, incumbent, and in other countries, uh, it can vary in a, in, a, in, a, in a brutal way uh, between one administration and the next one. So everything is possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. One last question, Philippe, before I let you go. And this is a bit personal as well. So it's very interesting because you, you studied aerospace engineering and then you went from that and you tried different things and then you landed up in the alcohol beverage industry. Um, tell me a little bit about that journey. How has it been for you and the transitions and, and why? I, I, would say, I would say that journey is driven by one um, character, personal characteristic, which is my curiosity. Um, I studied aerospace engineering because I was really curious about it. Then I wanted to go to finance. I wanted to see what is it to work in, a, in finance industry. I went to JP Morgan. Then I thought I should be a consultant, you know, helping companies reorganize, uh, uh, doing marketing plans and all that. And then I moved to another sector, which was the tableware sector, which was selling porcelain and cutlery and things like that. And then I ended up uh, finally at LVMH, first Vuitton, then running a distribution company in Asia, and then now Moet Tennessee. So what is the common red thread here is that I believe leadership is about giving a vision. It's about empowering people. It's about building teams which can be successful. It's about bringing into your team the capabilities which you need to be successful, regardless of your own capabilities. And that is constant in all these different fields. And then, of course, whenever you change to another category, I mean, in a way, you have you, you, you start on a new learning curve. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I started in Wines and Spirits, my first thing I said, I have to visit the vineyard. I had no idea how it works. I have to visit the winery. I have to understand this. I started reading books about winemaking, about different terroirs in the world and all that. I started to learn about distillation. I started to learn about uh, Scottish whiskey. So, and that's, that's very enriching if you come into a completely new field. And you have to, you are forced to, to learn at a very fast pace things which other people have been doing for their entire life. And, and, and I find that very rewarding and very exciting. And so for me, these changes have always been super positive. Of course, you always put yourself at risk at the beginning because you come in a field you don't know. But then, as you go on in a new role, you can then pull from previous experiences in very different roles. And that allows you to bring a perspective which maybe other people will not have in the role. I try in my team to have a good mix of people who, people who have been in this category for most of their career. And then also people who come from a different career and who will bring the same fresh a view than I have brought when I came in here. Absolutely. That perspective is yes. very important. Well, thank you so much for your time, Philippe. It was lovely chatting with you. Thank you. My thank pleasure. You.